Okay, so before I move on, I just want to make a quick comment now about these Lorentz transformations. So we saw that we were simply considering now linear transformations, where we can write our new coordinates as some linear combination or just some linear matrix that multiplies our old coordinates. So the new coordinates is just going to be some constant factors multiplied by our old coordinates. And these lambda matrices in no way depend on any of our coordinates. Because if you remember, we had the, the derivative of any lambda matrix has to be zero. So the way I introduced these lambda matrices now, I simply just gave you a matrix and we showed that it satisfied all the properties. Remember we had our other property that the metric should be left invariant by the Lorentz transformation. And so by making these postulates, I was able to just give you a matrix and we were able to show that it satisfies everything and it therefore is a Lorentz transformation. <clears throat> but now how do we know that these matrices that we found are all of the possible Lorentz transformations? How do we know we're not missing some that could also satisfy all these conditions? Well, as I sort of briefly alluded to, we could have found what these lambda matrices are in a more kind of general and group theoretic way by taking the approach that we're going to say, let's start looking at all lambda matrices which are in our general linear group, some appropriately large size, and then we can start using these properties to start restricting what the potential elements could be, and so we can start whistling down, going through our groups using the various properties. So remember, we also had something like debt lambda is plus or minus one, which immediately tells us we have to look at the S, SL special linear group, which all have to turn in plus one. And then by looking at now these properties, we're going to realize, okay, well, this is, as I mentioned, some kind of pseudo orthogonality property, which is then going to restrict us into these orthogonal groups. And we've seen because this is not just the identity here, but this has some minus signs in it, we're going to have to be in the pseudo orthogonal groups, which have kind of a negative and a positive part to them. And then, of course, our determinant one is going to restrict us to the special orthogonal groups. And so, then just by simply arriving at the special orthogonal group of the right dimension, in our case, it's going to be SO13. We simply know how this group is characterized and we know which matrices can be used to parameterize this group. And as we saw, or as we discovered, these are essentially the three rotation matrices, which give rotations around the coordinate, or rather rotations in the coordinate planes. So we have our R, X, Y, three rotation matrices, which if you recall, corresponded to SO3. So each one of these rotation matrices is going to have some parameter associated with it. So we would usually call these the Euler angles in three dimensions for a rotation around the Z axis, the Y axis, and the X axis, say theta, psi, and phi. But then in addition to our orthogonal rotations, we also found the new type of transformation, which is kind of looking similar to a rotation, but it's now a rotation that affects both a time and a space coordinate. So we saw that these were the boosts, which we traditionally just call lambda, and that these boosts we're going to see are going to be now hyperbolic rotations that rotate between the space and time planes. 
So transformation in the XT, YT, and ZT planes. So it's a bit small there. I'm going to talk more about this in future. But now simply just by having a bit of knowledge of group theory and how these groups are constructed, we can be fairly sure that these are all of the possible Lorentz transformations. You can just simply look at the dimensionality of this group. You're going to find it's going to be a six-dimensional group. And so these are the six possible element, or rather, these are the six possible representations of our group elements. And just remember that these are all continuous, they all depend on some parameter, and so there's going to be six of these three parameters corresponding to the dimensionality of the group. So this is what we call the Lorentz group. The Lorentz group, SO13, in the case of our universe we have three spatial and one time dimension. The Lorentz group in arbitrary dimensions you can just replace with a D there. And the really important thing to realise about the Lorentz group is that it is, it is an orthogonal group, so it's going to have to satisfy some kind of orthogonality condition, but it's a pseudo-orthogonal group, and so it satisfies a condition that looks like this, where we have our matrix that has some amount of minus ones, in this case just one, and then some amount of pluses. So I'm going to talk more about the geometric structure of this group in some future videos, but for now I just want to already start using this terminology that this set of all of our possible Lorentz transformations forms a group known as the Lorentz group. Already knowing a few things about group theory we can then realise some things. For example, the composition of now two Lorentz transformations is going to be another Lorentz transformation we're going to be able to derive, say, what happens if you compose a rotation and then a boost, or, for example, two rotations, and we're going to derive the algebra that this group is going to have, and we're going to see it's quite similar to the Lie algebra of SO3, but there are some subtleties introduced, and that these Lorentz transformations we can find, well, first of all, they don't compute, they don't commute, this is a non-abelian group, and we're also going to see that you can achieve a boost by simply composing two rotations and a few other weird things. or well, not necessarily weird, but just non-trivial. So that's the Lorentz group. These are our linear transformations that we can do on space-time that are not going to affect the metric. But now, there is just one other thing which I should mention for completeness, there is now another set of transformations that we can do in space-time that are also going to leave the metric invariant, but they're kind of so trivial it's almost not really even worth writing them down. But just for completeness I'll mention, rather than doing a linear transformation of the coordinates, we can just simply add some constant vector to our coordinates. So I'm just going to add now just any constant vector and this is going to produce my new coordinates. You can show that this is going to be a perfectly valid Lorentz transformation. It's just simply a trivial transformation where you're just adding a constant amount to all of our coordinates. It is going to satisfy all these properties but because it's not really a linear transformation it's just well, really, to write down a, a general linear transformation now, you have to introduce some linear factor onto your coordinates, and then you have to add some other constant amount. And it's this extra constant amount that we usually just ignore. But if we include it, this simply would just correspond to essentially just translating the origin of our coordinates by some constant vector and we refer to this just kind of a simple shift in position of coordinates this is what's known as a Poincaré transformation and if we now allow for these extra transformations we can effectively realise that we're going to have four possible 
more transformations. So we have the three rotations, the three boosts, and then the four possible Poincaré transformations in each coordinate direction. Because you can transform by a different amount in each coordinate direction, just shifting the origin to a different place in space-time, essentially. But if we now include these Poincaré transformations into our group structure, we effectively are now enlarging this Lorentz group to a larger group, which is known as the Poincaré group. But I want to just make it really clear that enlarging the group doesn't in any way affect the Lorentz group. The enlargement just kind of adds on these transformations as an extra possible for transformations. The Lorentz group is always unchanged, and we can always just fairly easily ignore these extra Poincaré transformations and just simply consider the more interesting kind of active part that's going to be doing something more interesting to our coordinates than just shifting them in space-time. So I'm going to revisit this when I discuss this group structure much more, but just for completeness now, and if you are knowing what to expect, we can express the Poincaré group as what's known as a semi-direct product of this Lorentz group. And then we have this semi-direct product with now essentially just a copy of R4 because these Poincaré transformations are just vectors that live in R4. And this semi-direct group product structure, I don't want to go any deeper into right now because this is quite technical and I'm going to need a lot more things to explain it, but this is how we realise the Poincaré group and it's this kind of semi-product of the Lorentz group with just a copy of R4. Okay, so I'm going to revisit all of this, just making some comments now, just mostly to make you realise that these six transformations are the only possible Lorentz transformations. You could spend a lot of time trying to come up with some others, but you're not going to be able to. <laughs> these are the only ones that you're going to be able to find satisfy all the properties. And so now we're going to try and come up with a physical interpretation for these transformations. Of course, we understand SO3 rotations fairly simply. They're just orthogonal rotations of our axes. We're quite comfortable with this idea. But now we're going to spend some time exploring what these Lorentz boosts are going to do.